Okay. And I just started recording. So if everybody is keeps their, their audio muted, then we'll be able to see what's going on here. Um, this is the, uh, the Chromie, which I, this is the first one I'm gonna tie. And uh, it's, as you can see, very shiny. So I get the hook, which is actually a part partridge. That's probably backwards, flashpoint. It's a size 12. Now, unfortunately, these partridge hooks, they call them size 12, but they're probably a good size bigger than what you think. Uh, and I've got a silver bead that uh, you can do it with, do these chromies with a white bead as well, but the silver bead, and I've got a, a collection of beads here, there's silver ones and white ones. Um, and I put the bead on with the, uh, these typical fly tying beads have a bigger hole at one end than in the other. I put the bigger hole facing the front because I'm going to be tying the gills on the front and I want to stuff that over top of the gills. So the first thing we're going to do though. Sorry, is, Dave, could you use a check nymph? Hook? Big pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you could use a check nymph. I use a, a just a, a Mustad C49S for the other ones that are smaller. Uh, and, and it's that's a pretty decent hook too. Okay. But I'm gonna tie these on these these ones here because they're bigger and I don't have the fancy camera like Florin, so you can get up close and see. So I'm tying on a slightly larger hook. So I'm gonna start with red thread back of the bend. And I'm going to tie it in back here. Um, I'm going to make a red butt because these things do when they start to move, they do tend to have a little bit of hemoglobin in the back end, which shows up. And it's so it's a bit of a tag right down to the very back part of the bend. And I'm going to bring that thread back up get my whip finisher and carefully whip finish this off at the back. It's just to get it, get it out of the way. Good Lord. There we go. That's the red red butt, and that again is a is a strike indicator, I guess strike strike attractor. Um, then I'm going to do the rest of it with uh, like an eight dot white thread for this guy, and I'm going to move the bead back, and I'm going to start right behind the hook eye. I'm going to make about five or six wraps and trim the tag into the thread. And right at about half an eye width behind the eye, I'm going to take this uh, Antron yarn and I'm going to take a small length of it. And I don't need very much because that's like about twice as much as I need. So I'm just going to get a small amount. It's fairly fine. And I'm gonna lay it across at an angle across the hook and tie that down from front to back. And I'm gonna take the other side, bring it forward and go from back to front. And then I'm gonna push this bead up and you can see it's going to push all those eyes those things forward so before i do that i'm going to just wrap in front i'm going to finish that off because i'm going to start the thread again behind the bead when i push it forward all that's doing is keeping the 
these gills from covering the eye too much. I'm gonna shove the bee forward and start my white thread in behind the bead again and use the white thread just to force the bead forward to cover up where I tied in the gills. Now, because they kind of get in the way when I'm going to tie the rest of the fly, I'm gonna cut them off right where the start of the eye is. Just trim them. So that's the, that's the gills for the pupa. Now, the next thing we need to do is I'm going to take a piece of fine silver wire, which is going to be the rib. And one of the things with these guys, you wanna have a nice smooth body. So I'm gonna start that right behind the bead. And I'm going to wrap close touching wraps all the way down the hook shank and tie that right down to the where I've got that red tag. And I don't need much of a tag. So I'm actually gonna wrap this a little past where the red was just enough to leave a little bit of red sticking out the back. I'm gonna come forward again. Again, trying to keep that body nice and smooth. That's why I'm using like an eight off thread here. And then I've got this, to make this a little bit of a depth to the fly, I'm gonna cover it all over with this stuff, which is a scud back that's clear in this, or in this case, light gray. I'm just gonna cut a short length of that. And I don't need much more than about two inches of it because this stuff stretches like crazy. And whoop, dropped it on the floor. Oh, I can't find it. There we go. And I'm gonna just start that right in behind the the bead again. This white thread has a tendency to unwind on me and flop over the wrong way. There we go. So I'm going to get that caught in right behind the bead. And then I'm going to stretch it nice and tight and wrap over top of that all the way back down the hook shank again and keeping, keeping it well stretched. And now that basically goes all the way around the hook and it helps make that nice smooth body. Thread back up. To bind the bead. And then I get my tinsel. And this is just the, the standard Mylar tinsel that has a, a gold, side and the silver side, and I've been using a lot of it, so I've almost stepped on that spool. Um, and once again, I want the silver side out. So when I tie it in at the front here, I'm going to tie it in with the gold side facing me, right behind the bead. And then I'm going to wrap that down the hook shank again and right down to where I finished off with the stretch floss. I'll bring my thread back up. And then take my uh, hackle pliers. And it's always, you wanna be careful with the first wrap because you want it to go over so the silver side is out. And by tying it in with the gold side out on the first pass down, that's what happens. It rolls over and the silver side is in now, is, is out and the gold side is in. 
And I'm going to wrap this forward with just a very slight overlap between the previous wrap and the next one. And that makes a nice smooth silver body. And I get right up behind the bead. And finish that off with a couple of good wraps over top and a couple in front. Trim that off right down close. Make sure the tag ends are pushed up against the bead. Finish it there. And then the next order of business is to use the heckle pliers again, wherever they don't them. I'm going to take my stretch material, hitch flex, and grab it with the heckle pliers. And once again, I'm going to start this by stretching the material so that it's fairly thin where it touches the hook. And I'm going to wrap again, slightly touching turns, just slightly overlap so that it's a nice smooth body. And what this stretch floss does is it gives that little bit of added depth to the body. When I get right behind the bead, I'm going to stretch it up good and tight. A couple of good wraps. And then pull it back and stretch it up tight again. And then pull hard and trim. Okay. Ed, I, I don't, sorry to interrupt, but for, I don't know if it's just me, but the fly is blurred. I think it's your camera's focusing on your shirt. Oh, okay. Let's see if this helps. Is that any better? I can probably bring this in a bit. How's that? Is that better? No. It's okay. Just, just carry on. Okay. That's the problem with using a... a uh, camera that's actually your uh, iPad camera and not a dedicated camera. So now I'm going to take the, uh, the silver wire and I'm going to make like six or seven turns of silver wire up the body. Get it behind the bead, good solid there. And then we take this and we do the helicopter thing and it will hopefully break. There we go. And then I'm gonna whip finish behind the bead. Let's do one more for a good measure. And that's him. Will you coat this, Dave? No, that's, that's the purpose of having the uh, Having having the, uh, the the stretch material, it gives it that translucence. Now, if you tied without the the stretch floss, then you tie it without the stretch floss, and then you just coat it with uh, UV material or with uh, Sally Hansen's hard as nails. Thank you. I've been tying this fly for twenty five years, and I learned several tricks just now watching you. So. 
Saturday yeah. mornings are special with you guys, Ty, and thank you. Good. So, Florin, do you want to take the next one? Dave, uh, I think one of the problems here is that your shirt is a very light color, and so are several of the materials ah. you're using. So, a little contrast. No, maybe the next time, uh, the one I do next will will be uh, will be a less uh, less of a problem because it's going to be a darker material. Just have to change your shirt. <laughs> you know, I, I there's. I have a couple of different shirts I use for these Saturday morning things. And the problem is getting a, a plain one that doesn't have a color that, like you say, that makes the, the fly disappear. <laughs> I guess you weren't aware that we had a dress code for fly tying. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the first one. Now, <clears throat> the next one doesn't have a bead. It's a pupa pattern. I'll get. And this one is, I'll put it here. Maybe this one will show better because it's uh, it's got a nice color to it. How's that for for focus? I think the focus is still off, but we can see this one better than the chromey because no, we, uh, no it's possible. Color. It's possible that my camera has been. It's got some crap on it. Is that any better? Actually, that does look a little. Rods and reels should ship in and buy you a dedicated camera. Well, yeah, I have, I have a camera. The, the issue is, is the computer. <laughs> the uh, I'm using my <coughs> iPad and tying from my living room because we have very. A slow internet service out where I normally would be tying at my roll top desk in the, in the doghouse. But, uh, and, and I, if I was tying out there, I would connect my good Canon SLR to the computer and be able, I have a macro lens that would work ideally for that. But unfortunately, if I try to do this out there, you wouldn't be able to see me because the picture would break up all the time because the internet service out there is not good. Dave, can you get a, like a, one of those uh, internet repeaters, like a little pod you just plug in the wall and it just extends your, <coughs> your network? Yeah, actually, we've got a guy that's supposed to come out and run a, uh, uh, a cable to the, where, where our TV is that, that will actually have a better reach. Because right now the signal has <coughs> to go through four walls to get out to the doghouse. Well, a solid cable, of course, would solve your yeah. problem for good yeah, yeah. so but he's well, Dave, you should busy. ask brian but he's been very busy so <laughs> <laughs> the the cable guy the, the internet guy who's going to come and do it for us he's been very busy i haven't had a chance to get him out we got to run a cable see right now our hub is in the living room here because it it uh it feeds us a, a digital audio streaming service that i run for the stereo and uh it's uh, from from here, the, even the old internet service just doesn't perform very well out in the doghouse because it goes through four walls. One, two. Okay, three, Dave, four, if, if you want me to take over, I can do one now and then you can take the next one. Yeah, yeah. If you take the first one, then I'll do the next one. It's, it's basically the same process, except instead of a bead this time, I'm going to be doing it with a, a thorax, a peacock curl with some pheasant tail as a, as a shell back and some different colors. Okay, here we are. So um, this thing here is a size 16 uh, Togans hook. And what I'm going to actually tie here is going to be more like a size 18 fly. Um, so this is their heavy wire scud hook. And um, basically, it's like a TM called 2457 at the fraction of the cost. Um, this is a super easy fly. So it's black thread, no bead, nothing. Then I have some copper wire that's a brassy size. So it's fairly fine, but not the finest copper wire. And I attach it behind the eye of the hook. 
and then I just wrap it around towards the, not the wire, but keep the wire along the shank of the hook. <coughs> I'm not going to repeat all the details. We've done this many, many times. So just keep the wire on the near side of the hook towards you. Let it hang there at the back. Then grab a pinch, a tiny little pinch of super fine black dubbing. And just wrap that on, the, on your thread. So here you just want to be very gentle with the quantity of dubbing because you don't want to make a bulky fly. Okay, so just basically, you know, double or triple the thickness of the thread, but not something that, you know, shows like a big clump. Okay, so fairly fine. Okay, start wrapping forward. And if you're not happy with the thickness, just you can always pull on the dubbing, pull down and twist a little bit more and that'll thin it out a bit more. So you can see I'm just barely thickening the body here. And stop about an eye and a half behind the eye. And then rib. Cover, you still have dubbing on the thread. Two turns is all it takes before you can helicopter the wire away. Whoops, thread broke. That's hazard of the, this particular occupation here. So let's reattach the thread where it broke off and try to save this, okay? Just go back a little bit over the wire. So the wire is secure now, which is the main concern. The rest can be easily trimmed off, okay? And now what I need to do, I just have a little bit of fuzz here, but that's okay. Okay, so I saved, I saved the wire ribbing, otherwise I would have had to go back and restart the whole thing. And now I just need another tiny little dab of dubbing. Sometimes if you're, if you're not very careful or your fingers are a little rough, the, uh, the risk is that when you helicopter the wire away, especially with eight odd thread, it may just break on you, which is what happened here. So then I, I just build a little ball at the back at the front here for a thorax. And then one, two whip finishes, done. This is one easy fly. The second easy fly, which was, I see Don Anderson there. Good morning, Don. Uh, morning, Florin. You showed us your little black midge on, on Wednesday, right? Yeah, but it didn't have that damn bead on it. It didn't have the damn bead on it, but here is the, call it simplified or, or complicated, if you will. If you're fishing this in an area where lead is not allowed, here's an almost as easy one as the one Don showed. So black dubbing, and you tell me where I'm going wrong. I know, I think your body was just thread. Yep. So the easy fly is just a bit of lead, thread for the body, no dubbing. But what I'm doing is I'm doing basically what I just showed you earlier, a beaded version. So just go and dub a body. And you can stop right here and leave it like that and, and that's all it is. Just a pa. I'm having rotten luck with breaking thread this morning. So I, uh, I haven't done a good job of polishing my, my fingers. So I'm going to take another spool of thread here and finish this off. The alternative here is to add a dab of somewhat sparkly material and one of the things that I was experimenting with 
is this uh, diamond dub stuff, which is giving off purplish bluish reflections. And that looks pretty nice behind the bead. It just gives a just a very subtle hint of a different color. There you go. And I have a stray fiber there that it's easy to trim. Okay. And two whip finishes for safety. And I broke the thread twice, but that's the as the fly, you can see there's just a tiny hint of sparkle there. Okay. And you can whip up a bunch of these things in no time. Okay, Dave, back to you. Okay. So this is a similar fly, similar process to the last one. And uh, let me just go here so I can see what I'm doing. Um, and uh, it's just different colors and materials, but this is the pupa version, which doesn't have a bead. It has a thorax of peacock curl and a, a pheasant tail wing case. So again, I'm going to use the same hook just to provide some scale for you. You can see what's going on. Okay, so same process again. Whether the red butt is is critical or not on these things, I, I, it it's easy to tie on, and I don't think it hurts. <laughs> if you so were talking this fishing, what size hooks would you be using? I would use a, a like a, a Mustad uh, C forty nine S, which is you know basically a, a long shank scud hook or a caddis hook. And I would, I would use a 10 would be the largest and you're probably gonna go down to maybe an 18, but it gets really tough doing an 18 with this complicated a pattern. Dave, you said having the red doesn't hurt. I think the trout would beg to differ. What's that? I think the trout would beg to differ that the red doesn't hurt. Because when they get hooked, they feel that. <laughs> so I'm just, again, I'm just tying this in here so that it has a red butt at the back. I, I do know that for uh, a thing like pheasant tail nymphs and, and whatnot, the red butt does make a difference, doesn't it, Don? <laughs> We've tested it out on the red deer for sure. I also agree the red butt is dynamite. Well, I'm, so I'm gonna start my, start my green thread behind the eye. And this time I'm gonna, again, do, do things a little reverse from normal. Um, I need, to put my wing case on first. So I'm gonna take um, probably five or six fibers from a pheasant tail, pull them off the stem. And then I'm gonna put them on tips to the rear with the, uh, the colored side facing down. And I'm going to tie that on just behind the eye and tie it right up to the eye. <laughs> I'm going to come back about an eye width behind and trim off the butts, the tips. I hope this uh, shirt change helps the focus. So far, so good. Yes, it does. Good. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and 
the first thing that goes on is the last thing wound forward, which is fine green wire. And I'm going to start, now I'm going to leave a little bit of a space here for the thorax later. But I'm going to set that down on the hook. And I'm going to wind over top of that with thread down the hook shank, down to the bend, and down to the point like the last one about that sixteenth of an inch of, of uh, red showing out the back. Come back up. And same tinsel, except this time I'm going to tie it in silver side in so that the gold side is out when I start wrapping it forward. So if I tie it with the silver side facing me, and go side in, take it at the tip, and then wrap that down all the way to the back. And this time I've got some more of this uh, scud back, but this time it's an olive. You can actually do it with an olive or a darker green. I'm gonna tie that in at the thorax point. It's always tricky getting this thing to go on there first little bit there okay it's done and again stretching it well ah I'm not done darn thread keeps spinning on me and it flops the wrong way. There we go. Again, stretching it good. Bed back up to the front. And once again, my tinsel is going to come out and go around. So this time, because I've tied it in the other way, the gold side should be out and the silver side in. Off the front. And then I need to tighten this vice down just a hair because that hook is moving. 
and then once again the uh, tackle pliers to stretch this material as I lay it over. My fingers aren't cooperating today. There we go. Stretch it out. You see it, it changes that color of the body to a nice sort of olivey green color. <clears throat> And that's the, uh, the idea is to give, because these chronomid pupa will have different body colors and that's why you end up with a collection of different colored chronomids. And again, with the wire over rib, you want six or seven wraps of this rib. So far that looked an awful lot like the, uh, the last one. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up to where that wing case is. And this is where I'm gonna tie in that little bit of antron again for, wing, for gills. And once again, I don't want a whole lot of them a fairly thin, sparse bit of antron. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did with the other one. I'm going to put one on one side, half of it on one side, and half of it on the other. Like a figure X over the thing in the middle. Then I'm going to take my bit of peacock curl I really only need one strand because this thorax is not too big. Peacock, you see you get a the butt end is skinnier than the tip end, so I'm going to tie it in by the tip end because I want it to be, be a little bit fuzzy. I'll tie in right behind where I've got that white stuff. And I'm going to overwrap that white stuff forward to just behind the eye. And I'm going to make a thorax with the peacocker. I'm going to bring my thread back to the back end of the thorax. And then I'm gonna wind my peacock curl thorax in front of the thread. And make that thorax about double the thickness of the body. Tie it off behind the thorax. Butts. I'm going to take this wing case now and bring it up between the white gills, back over the top, hold it down, and I'm going to tie off right behind the thorax. Stand it up, wrap in behind. Trim that off nice and tight. And then I'm going to whip finish 
right over there's top. There's no weight on that, eh, Dave? Nope. You can if you want. Um, you, you can put a little few, I'd say like three, maybe four little wraps of, of small lead wire to make, uh, to make a bit heavier fly. I've tied them, I've tied some each way. And then I'm just gonna come in here with my scissors at the end of this and trim these gills down nice and short. About a sixteenth of an inch sticking out, if that. <coughs> Pardon me. And that's him. There you go. So Dave, in this case, the uh, gills actually come out sideways as opposed to forward yep. when you do it with the yep. uh, foamy. And, and that allows you to see the eye of the hook to actually put your thread through the eye of the hook. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's the point. You don't want to cover up the eye of the hook or you're going to have trouble tying. No, that's good. Thank you. So, uh, Horn's going to do the dark version. Um, but I've also done a dark version. If you want to look at the, uh, oops, he's put his camera on already. Oh, if you want to look? If you want to look at my box, there's there's the dark version there, and that's done with similar process except using this dark uh, dark red brown uh, flex. Sim similar process. Um, and then if you want to know how many how many coronamid you need and what type, there's my coronamid box. <laughs> different sizes and different colors. There you go. So Florin, you're up. Okay, back back to easier flies. So this time I'm going to go to a different body material, and that is <coughs> and tail, okay? So here are two flies that are very nicely done with golden pheasant. So the first one, so I'm going to do the, the easier one first. So the first one is essentially a bottomy merger, as I call it, because it's got this bead here, and it's it's a pretty it's a pretty heavy one. So I'm I'm going to need a a copper rib. So this is the same wire that I was using on the Black Beauty that I did at the very beginning. And the reason I need this wire is because that pheasant tail is very very fragile stuff. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few fibers of the pheasant. Not too many, you don't want to have <coughs> too thick of a body here. So four or five, whoops, four or five fibers is, is, is all that's needed. Remove them from the, from the main stem and tie them by the tips with the tips facing forward like this. Okay. Once you got the pheasant attached, just wrap it on the hook gently. And you get a nice kind of tan and dark brown mottled look the fly, do a wrap or two extra here right behind the bead because usually there is a gap behind beads that needs filling. And so a couple of wraps in front, cut the pheasant fibers and then just counter wrap with the wire. This is going to secure this very nicely. I come to the front to 
wraps of thread over the wire. That's usually enough to secure it. Helicopter the wire. This is a little thicker, so it takes a little longer. Okay, two more wraps. And then for the finishing touch, I just want a little bit of a sparkle bit here. And what I have is I have just a few fibers of this stuff, which is like a very fine um, pearl flashable type material. It, you find this stuff under different, different names. This one is called Super Flash Twisted, but I don't really think it matters that much what it's called. You kind of know what, what sort of material this is. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to attach a few of these fibers. I, I need to give them, just leave a little bit of length here, but not, not an awful lot. So as you can see, just a little bit beyond the eye of the hook. Secure, couple of turns, let everything flow back and then get your your finger and fold the whole mess back and wrap over this fiber so it's all now going back. Take your scissors, trim to about the same length as the wide, as the bead, uh, the bead's diameter. So you just have this little bit of a sparkly wing here that, that catches light. And then whip finish. Again, I do my two whip finishes. And this is the fly. I really like to fish this thing for uh, for white fish when there is anything emerging, like you know, little little mayflies, midges, anything. I don't bother with the tail on this either. It's like this is is good enough, and it works very well. So if you need presentation near the bottom, this works very well. The last one is the only fly that has more than two materials on it. Sorry, there was a question. Yeah. The uh, that um, that uh, whitish material that you put, it's fairly stiff, is it? Um, not very. It's fairly limp in a in a long, but it's fairly stiff in a it's in a short. short length. It's stiffer. Okay. You can also use some um, diamond dub type material. Anything that just gives you a little bit of a Sparkle. kind of an emerging, you know, a splitting thorax that's that's filling up with air prior to emergence. Okay. That's you. that's the idea that I'm I'm trying to to capture there. Okay, so the last fly same size hook, the only thing I've changed and I don't know if it's visible or not, I went to a copper bead. I don't think it's vitally important, but copper bead goes very well as a complement to golden pheasant tail. Now this particular fly was all kinds of shown to us in Edmonton by Michael Dell as part of his uh, series of uh, flies to uh, flies to use for imitating various stages of the uh, blowing olive, and this is a slightly modified pheasant tail nymph. So again, everything you'll see here is going to be familiar in some way or another. So the first thing is take about four fibers of that golden pheasant tail and attach them near the bend of the hook. Okay, if that feels like it's a little too long, you can still, if you didn't tighten this too much, you can pull a little bit and shorten that tail just a touch. Okay, then bend over the pheasant fibers back and do a couple of wraps in front. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to need is some fine wire. This is fine copper wire for the rib, but this is red wire, okay? 
So that's the other modification. So I'm going to tie this, this wire, not super short. I can go all the way to the bead with it. And the reason I, I don't wanna tie it too short is for two, for two purposes. One is to make sure that it's well attached. And the, one, the other one is to maintain still a reasonably smooth underbody for the fly where I'm going to be wrapping the pheasant, okay? So I can go, I don't have to go all the way behind the bead because I'm going to have a thorax as well. And then wrap the pheasant fibers for the body. So this is the abdomen of the fly. You can do this with hackle pliers as well. Just find that if I have enough fiber length, it's actually easier to not break the fibers if I'm using my hands. Um, it seems like if I use the hackle pliers, I'm a little heavy handed there. So I actually prefer to do this by hand. And then take the wire and again, do a counter rib. So counter wind the wire. This does two things. It crosses at an angle that wraps a pheasant tail. So that strengthens everything a lot better. And second, it is much more visible. If you want a more subtle effect, you're going to wrap the wire the same way you did the pheasant. Okay, so now you have almost 90% of the fly. The last ingredient is a thorax of peacock pearl. And all I'm going to need here is two relatively fine strands of peacock. I'm going to trim the tips which are always very, very fragile. Now, normally if I use peacock curl, I would, so I'm just going to attach this right behind the bead. Normally if I were to do a body with peacock curl or anything like that, I would use a dubbing loop and that gives me a, a tight body that's virtually indestructible. Now for this fly and others, I found that if I just do a little bit of peacock curl behind the bead, that already gives the peacock curl a tremendous amount of protection. So here I'm just going to wrap the peacock without any further complications. So I'm just going to do a few turns until, and as you can see, I, I went with the, with the pheasant tail fibers all the way to the bead, because again, there's usually a little bit of a gap here that needs filling so you don't have to worry about having too much material. Actually having a little bit more of an underbody behind the bead is helpful. Okay. And then just a few wraps right up against the bead. As you can see, it seems to be swallowed up underneath. And then a couple of wraps in front cut, two whip finishes, whoops. One. And done. So these are easy flies to do. And effectively, if you look at this thing and you compare this to a standard size 18 nymph hook, like a 9671 Mustad, for example, you'll find that this is tied on a size 16 curve hook is more like an 18 fly. So this is what I do when I wanna tie small flies, this is what I'm doing. And in fact, earlier when we were just chatting, I was tying this thing on a size 18 curve hook, which is gonna be my size 20 nymph. Okay. And I did the same for all the other 
flies that I showed you. So these are the size 18 hooks, which give me tiny little flies, as you can see. And I can, I actually have this hook, I bought it in a size 20 as well, which will allow me to do an even tinier fly. The other advantage of the hook is you can actually see here from the picture is that the wire is very thick on these things. So they sure. should, they should sink reasonably well. Yes. Um, what's the name and brand number of that hook? Uh, that's a that's a Togans. Uh, let me. I'll show you the bag. Okay, I know. I know the ones you're talking about now. Yeah, it's, I think they call it a grub hook. Um. Yeah. That's the one. And yeah. I bought I bought them in 16, 18, 20, which is probably as small as I need and 14 if I really need to do size 16. And they also make an emerger, which is a, the fine wire version of this. Yeah, the problem is that the merger hooks and stuff like that is they're, they're so damn thin wire, they just straighten out. Like the C49S, for example, I find anything that's, uh, yeah. you know, round size 14s and so on, like, you're okay on, on cutthroat trout that don't pull very hard, but you stick a rainbow of five pounds, that hook is going to straighten out, guaranteed. It just doesn't have enough jam in it. Yeah, well, they, they, these ones are, these are heavy wire hooks. Yeah, so. they look good. I have to give some, I have to order some up. Yeah, and, you know, the price is like a quarter or less than the, the TMCOs. Uh, so would you, you know, well, I know that, but that's a given. But would you call them top quality? Uh, Obviously built by the Chinese. Okay. Um, most hooks these days are made in China, except for, except for, I think Daiichi is still made in Japan. And uh, I think Tiemco, if it says on the box made in Japan, then it is. But everything else is made in China 100%. Yeah. Uh, no matter how expensive it is, including those uh, Arex hooks. Yeah. If you look at the packages, it says made in Norway slash China. The, the I didn't know Norway was Norway. a province of China today, but apparently it is. No, um, the, the packaging comes from China, from Norway. The packaging is from Norway and the yeah. hooks are made in China. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I found with the Togan hooks, and this applies to these emerger ones, and even more so to their saltwater hooks. When you pinch the barb, it breaks and it leaves a little rough spot. When you pinch the barb on a Daiichi hook, it also breaks, but it doesn't leave a rough spot. That's the, the one difference that I found. The other thing is the, um, the Daiichis, they tend to be generally speaking on fairly finer wire than most of the other hooks. Yeah. You know, like if you compare the Daiichi 1260 to the Tiemco 200 R, yeah. the Daiichi is a lot finer wire. So if I can buy the, the Tiemco 200 R, I prefer to buy that one. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So there's Don, I, I found that the regular Togan scud hooks are a little light for those rainbows you mentioned. And I had the ones that, uh, the heavy ones, and they're, they're they're called three times heavy, and they're great. Yeah, that's yeah, what they, I was thinking too. Yeah, like for, the I've been using uh, Mustad C sixty zero six eight, and they uh, getting them down to eighteen now is getting real tough. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. No, they true to size. No, why the problem is that every one of those hook sizes are they seem to be invented. Certainly, they're all smaller as the numbers get larger. <laughs> but they're all a little different in size according to my micrometer. So here's here's the, the example. The, this is uh, the large one is tied on that uh, on that uh, partridge hook, which is a really hefty wire hook. Yeah, you bet. And that's tied on the C49S, and this is a size ten supposedly, and this is a, supposed to be a size twelve. <laughs> 
what a difference in size. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no uniformity anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the, the fly line story. Yeah, so to me, is, the token hooks, is, they, they feel relatively true to size. Okay, we'll have to order some up. They're not expensive, what the heck. Yeah. So this, is the, yeah. this is the dark version of the, the, the other one I just tied. Yeah. So Dave, if I may, I think you're a little bit short in your coronamid box. <laughs> I got that's three of these. One, that's just one box. That's just one box. I have three of these. <laughs> Do you label those little white things there? Or are there like labels for sizes or what? I made all the labels, yes. But what, what do you write on the labels? <clears throat> um, ice cream cone, Black Sally, Pornabid. Oh, the names of the flight. Okay. Black and silver. Yeah, it's all the names of the coronamids. Gary, I don't think you have enough... Uh... Coronamids, three boxes. <laughs> you can never have enough coronamids. Yeah, that's, I'm that's true. This. Excuse me, I'm, I'm new at this and I've just got some info off the internet. I've uh, 